Hello travelers and welcome to Adventures in Security. This video looks at fileless malware, an attack vector that makes up over half of today's malicious software attacks. What we'll look at also applies to advanced persistent threats. After a walkthrough of an attack, we'll step through three phases of defense implementation an organization can implement over time, depending on budget and other resources. You can download the script for this video, formatted as a study guide, from a link in the video description. The script includes a selected bibliography. Fileless malware is popular with threat actors because it is mainly invisible to traditional antivirus defense. Instead of immediately dropping files on the target device, a threat actor can insert an executable directly into RAM. This bypasses file signature comparisons usually used to detect malicious content. Instead of reinventing an attack path, I use the Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain as shown in this graphic. The kill chain offers the steps typically taken by a threat actor when attempting to compromise a system. For now, I'll focus on the process leading to installation. Once a threat actor, a T or TA, completes re uh, reconnaissance to identify possible attack opportunities, she creates an attack package designed to take advantage of known or perceived system vulnerabilities. She then configures a lure designed to trick a user into doing what is needed to install the attack package. This is where things begin to differ between file-based and fireless malware. When a TA needs to install files to start the system compromise, they're scanned as they are written to disk or loaded into RAM, scanned by antivirus. If one or more of the files in the package matches a known malicious file signature, it's blocked or quarantined by the antivirus. When a fileless payload is sent, it goes directly to RAM. This bypasses the file scanning process. Some fileless payloads will write code to the Windows registry in order to reload after a reboot, ensuring persistence. Further, a fileless malware uses legitimate, trusted applications already installed and running. Typical applications used include PowerShell and Windows Management Instrumentations, WMI. TAs can also use vulnerabilities in trusted applications to achieve attack objectives, including theft of credentials, implementation of ransomware, and data theft. Some fileless implementations, sometimes called vapor worms, can spread across the network very quickly like any other worm infecting all vulnerable devices with fileless infections. At this point, the rest of the kill chain steps occur primarily the same for both file-based and fileless attacks. So what I cover in the rest of the video applies to all attacks, especially well-obfuscated advanced persistent threats, or APTs. Organizations often have to reach maximum protection over multiple budget periods. Further, some might only make it as high as a base controls environment. I split controls into three phases that I would use if planning a three to five year controls implementation project. Defending against any attack requires a basic level of layered defense, a defense that can interfere with file lists and other APTs, but leave some gaps in an organization's defenses. The following is a list of minimal controls loosely based on FIPS 200, a U.S. government standard available with a link in the video description and in the bibliography. The first safeguard in this defense is traditional host-based antivirus protection, supported by a host-based firewall and IDS. These supporting safeguards help detect malware that makes it through and, if adequately hardened, block any unexpected traffic traffic required for malware command and control, and TA data extrusion. Most software vendors today provide executables signed with their code signing certificates, a signature that provides a high level of proof that an executable is authentic. Websites infected or managed by a TA are common ways to get malware packages to user devices. This happens when users casually browse the internet or are directed to an attack server by clicking a link in an email, a social networking website, or other place they commonly visit. Filtering where users can go on the web, blocking known malicious sites and high-risk website categories, 
is a great way to mitigate associated risks. Email that looks legitimate is an excellent threat vector, relying on user behavior to infect target systems, locking known or suspected attack emails and stripping executables from allowed messages as another layer of APT and fileless malware protection. Endpoint firewalls provide a wall against malware command and control. Effective firewall configuration only allows expected traffic between an endpoint and any other device, whether on-premise or on the internet. Endpoint IDS supports the resident firewall by detecting unusual or known malicious patterns over firewall allowed sessions. Only expected traffic should pass between the internet and on-premises devices. IPS detects unexpected behavior caused by malware operation across the network, blocking known malware patterns. We should always disallow any software installation not on the organization's approved application list. At the elementary level of defense, using the appropriate GPO, all user installations can be blocked requiring an administrator to install approved applications and requiring removing local admin rights from user accounts. We must also ensure that known vulnerabilities are patched. This is always a critical control. Organizations should use one of the available end-user device hardening templates to reduce device attack surfaces optimally, including removing all unneeded applications. A good practice is creating an image for each device category used across the business. Categories include areas like AP Clerk, AR Clerk, and Sales Rep. Using these images helps ensure consistent, secure configurations across all devices. Identity and Access Management, or IAM, must include enforcing least privilege, separation of duties, and need to know for each business role. These restrictions help limit what a TA can access once he has compromised a user device or a user account. IAM must also include accountability, the ability to trace any transaction back to who executed it and when. Simple network segmentation using VLANs enables more granular control over the traffic to and from highly sensitive and categorized systems. When the VLAN access control lists are appropriately set, what a TA on a network can see is severely limited. Advanced malware will always get through eventually. Consequently, we need to monitor for abnormal behavior continuously. Finally, we need to train our users. Reliance on user behavior is a control of last resort, a control that we rely on to fill the gaps left by the other controls based on tech, tech that lacks human frailties. Some remaining uh, controls that are needed in a baseline, which go far beyond advanced persistent threats to cover just about everything else, is starts with governance, and that is the oversight provided by C-level management and driven by policy, and audits ensure that policy objectives are being met. We need to ensure that every change to the network or a system is adequate, adequately vetted for risk with a good change management program. That ensures that it doesn't that changes don't weaken expected trust levels. All information resources need physical protection with good physical security, preventing TAs from bypassing logical controls to insert malware or extract data directly from their targets. We can't know how exposed the system is to infection without performing risk assessments throughout its life cycle. And a TA will eventually get through. So quick detection, containment, eradication, and recovery through a good incident management program are important controls for mitigating business impact. These controls are the minimum needed for, to protect today's businesses effectively, businesses of any size. Organizations that can only afford to implement, implement and manage some of these controls internally can find cloud services that perform these functions. However, we still need to be at the point where we can effectively manage fileless or AP intrusions. So let's take a look 
at phase two defense. The previous controls are just a baseline, one that also requires a robust incident management program, a program that applies to all three phases. In the next phase, I add additional deterrence, prevention, detection, and corrective controls that strengthen an organization's ability to manage more advanced attacks. The first control are next generation firewalls or NGFs. NGFs provide several integrated functions needed to dig deeper into what is happening on the network, what to block, and what to allow. Unlike traditional firewalls, they go far beyond controlling traffic by looking at IP addresses, port numbers, and basic traffic anomalies. In addition to including IPS and web filtering, an, I an NGF can also be used to implement next-generation antivirus, or NGVA. While traditional antivirus no compares known file signatures to executables and other files, NGVA can also recognize known good executables, sending unrecognized files to the cloud for sandboxed analysis. In the cloud, the executable runs in a sandbox with its behavior monitored. Suspicious or questionable behavior in the sandbox causes the NGVA to block its use. NGFs provide an excellent way to introduce behavior analysis into antivirus detection. Another functionality of NGFs is the ability to look at packets to determine related applications. The administrator can configure the firewall only to allow specific applications to pass while blocking all others. This approach is an excellent safeguard against malware, malware not detectable by other means, that is moving across the network, or at least trying to. EDR solutions, or Endpoint Detection and Response, also provide behavior analysis, an analysis that looks at endpoint behavior. Usually using cloud-based servers, EDR enables quick detection and analysis of anomalous behavior, providing an effective response that mitigates business impact. EDR focuses on endpoint protection, but XDR, Extended Detection and Response, goes further, integrating multiple analytical solutions into a single AI-driven threat management solution. Gartner defines XDR as a SaaS-based, vendor-specific, security threat detection and response tool that natively integrates multiple security products into a cohesive security operations system that unifies all licensed components. XDR combines security information and event management capabilities, user and entity behavior analysis, or UEBA, network detection and response, and EDR, aggregating and correlating their data. Using AI, XDR uses the output of the correlation engine to identify threat traces, even those of threats deeply embedded and effectively hidden. In phase one, I address segmentation, usually treated as placing multiple devices on a segment, devices that can talk to each other, and anything else whose packets make it onto the segment. Microsegmentation, a big step towards zero trust, pulls perimeters to surround individual devices or resources. It also prevents devices that might be on the same segment from speaking to each other. Microsegmentation is possible with VLAN supported with NGFs or by using multi-homed NGFs designed for that purpose. As we move later into zero trust and phase three, NGFs and layer three VLAN switches can be replaced with special appliances or software agents that control subjects subject to resource access. A subject is defined as user plus application plus device or any other entity attempting to access a resource. We must always assume that a TA has made it onto our network. As we've already seen, there might be little or no trace of the attack detectable with IPS, IDS, antivirus, or other detection safeguards. So we have to go looking looking with our own eyes, relying on our own knowledge, experience, and intuition to find and deal with hidden threats. According to Robert and Rob Lee, threat hunting is a focused and iterative approach to searching out 
identifying and understanding adversaries internal to the defender's networks. So instead of relying on indicators of compromise, threat hunting teams look for indicators of attack. For a more detailed look at threat hunting, see the article at, a, at the link in the video description entitled Threat Hunting, What it, Is It and Why It's Necessary? When we perform internal risk assessments, we usually need more time to make a complete and focused attempt to crack into a system. This allows unknown and hard-to-find vulnerabilities on our devices and applications. Bug, bon bug bounties enable outside white hat hackers to attempt to break our defenses. If a vulnerability is found by one of the vetted attackers, she receives a payment. This enables many talented people to spend their time performing controlled pen tests. Once the phase one and phase two controls are enabled, we have a pretty secure network, but we can go one step further. Everything we've looked at assumes some level of trust for subjects, network segments, and objects. However, this is fading as a best practice, giving way to zero trust networking. The principles of zero trust are, assume that every subject, network segment, and device is infected, or will be shortly. Everything connected to the network is considered a resource that resides in a trust zone. A trust zone can contain multiple resources, but ideally, it will include a single resource or application. All communication is secured whether on the internal network or in the cloud, regardless of subject or resource location. Trust is not given just because a network segment or resources is located behind a network perimeter. Access to each resource is granted on a per-session basis. Once a subject terminates a session, any future session requires authentication and authorization. All assets and subjects are monitored, with their behavior included in trust zone access assessments. No connected resource should be exempted, even if it resides in a low trust zone. Access to resources is determined by dynamic business policies enforced at policy enforcement points. These policies, set by the administrator, check the results of session characteristics analysis to determine if access is allowed and at what level. And finally, resource authentication and authorization are dynamic and strictly enforced before access is allowed. This requires strong identity management that supports multi-factor authentication and attribute-based access control. Zero Trust doesn't allow any application access to any resource without first checking its current risk profile, a profile that's based on user role, device used, device owner, device health, usually reported via a software agent, time of day, day of the week, resource classification and categorization, user behavior, and device behavior, or anything or any other session characteristics that are measurable that the administrator wants to check as part of an access control analysis. This assessment is performed for every session initiation, and every session is dropped after a transaction is completed. Changes in user or device behavior caused by fileless malware or other infections will cause a zero trust policy engine to block authentication. For examples of how this works, watch the playlist at the link above. This is one look at how an organization might approach securing its resources against advanced attacks. As this existing organizations must shore up their phase one safeguards before implementing more advanced controls. An advanced malware risk assessment for highly categorized systems and data then shows where phase two controls should focus. It isn't necessary in most cases to attempt phase two protections across the entire network, especially when we need to address sensitive system residual advanced threat risk with phase three implementations. I often get pushback from some of my students who claim that going beyond the basics is beyond their organization's budget capabilities. 
This is usually because they approach this as an all-or-nothing project. However, we need to approach our advanced malware defense as we would any other defense, prioritizing systems according to categorization and associated risk, including those with the highest risk in our security improvement projects. That's it for this video. If you have questions, please ask. And if this information was helpful, please subscribe. And until next time, be careful what you click.